Hey, buddy, how honest do you want to be about what we're doing right now? Uh, all the way. Always honest. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, well, you know, honest doesn't mean you have to say everything about what's happening in life and all of that. But okay. all right. Well, how do you read it? What do you make of this moment that we're having right now? All right. So here's the deal. So Matt and I recorded days ago, maybe a couple weeks ago. I don't remember when it was. When was it? Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, it was like. Three days ago, four oh, days ago. Okay, it felt like weeks ago. Okay, and, fair enough. And We've we done did a lot. It, and we did it in the middle of you doing a lot of things in your personal mm -hmm. life, and me mm -hmm. doing the the final approach on a video. Mm -hmm. And um, when we got set up with our Bluetooth stuff, we had a huge delay, like yes, huge delay, nightmarish. And, yeah, it was chasm. Bad. Yeah, and so we recorded this episode about Italy, which is something we've been wanting to talk about forever, mm -hmm. and we sent it to Tina. Mm -hmm. And the problem with polishing a turd. <laughs> I can just see where it's going. I can see it in your expression. Is that yeah, it's okay. still a turd? <laughs> yeah, it's still a turd. Yeah. We, uh, we've done a turd episode before. And I'm going to let people just guess which one it is. But we have a turd episode on this podcast. You and I both know which one it is. Yeah. We... It's the bar that we <laughs> we aspire to never stoop below, and we both listened to the episode. We were going to publish it today, and we were both kind of beating around the bush a little bit, but ultimately, I think we agreed, dude, this is a turd. It's a we turd. Should we not, shouldn't that's publish. not nice to the third chair. <laughs> no, it's we not. We should not publish this. Yeah. So, so we're not. Um, no, we're not going to. So here we are. Uh, we, we like to get two episodes out every month, and uh, mm -hmm. we're on the last day of the month, and uh, yes. the sun is down, and we're going to do this in a very short amount of time. Uh, yeah, and I think it's okay, because the conversation I wanted to have for this episode, it didn't make sense when we recorded it, because you weren't done with your thing. But you've been telling me about this neutral buoyancy lab thing that you're doing. You've been teasing me with details. I remember when you traveled to do it. And I've been really curious about it, but I hadn't seen the video. I hadn't seen any footage. I just knew it was a massive endeavor, a huge investment of time, and the a massive edit as well. It's going to be like an hour, an hour, like a feature film yeah. kind of length of uh, you know just total runtime that you were putting into it. And so we weren't able to do the episode we wanted to do, which was this one, because you weren't done with the thing. Well, now, as luck or providence, depending on how you see things would have it, the video is out. I've had a chance to watch the first little bit of it, and now we can do the episode that I want to do all along, which is ask you about your neutral buoyancy lab thing and what the heck you're doing in scuba suits writing on little like wax boards with NASA astronauts and stuff in a fake underwater moon. I mean, did I, am I seeing that right? That's right, yeah. It was awesome. So um, years ago, th there was a decision made that... If you were going to prepare astronauts for a zero gravity environment, you have to figure out a way to take their their weight away from them. So their bodies have mass, but you want to take the weight away, right? Sure. So how would you do that? Like if you wanted to do that, somebody's like, Whitman, get in here. And then you're all wearing the little white shirts with a little black tie. Whitman, we've, we've got to train the astronauts right now. And uh, they're going to be in a weightless environment and we don't know what to do. This is your job, Whitman. Go do it. What would You're you really do? asking me? Yeah, what would you do? <laughs> okay, this is embarrassing, but this I would not have gone straight to go underwater. I would have gone to some elaborate gyroscope with a bunch of bungee cords attached to some kind of belt thing, like the unit that I use to suspend my microphone that I usually use. It's all it's got like shocks in every direction so that if you bump anything, it doesn't go all the way through to the microphone. Except I would put that around the astronaut and training's waist on like a belt, but then all the weight would be distributed right from their waist and that wouldn't feel natural. So I'd put on some kind of suit with like suspenders and stuff that comes off their shoulders and their arms. It would be this whole elaborate Ready Player One style rig that sort of bounces and then I would get the tension of all of the goofy rig stuff to be such that it would match the gravity of wherever I'm training the astronaut to go. So, you know, if you're going to the moon, I guess you got to figure out however many G's the moon is and you get the tension just right and you tune it for their weight 
and then you put him in the giant, ridiculous, basically baby hopper, toddler jumper machine. Yeah. And you have him do moves and stuff. That's how I would do it. That's how I would engineer that. Go ahead and mock me. No, uh, that would work, actually. <laughs> I don't think it would work. How on earth would that work? It does work. Na NASA has built one, and I've seen it. Yeah. A baby hopper for astronauts? Yes, absolutely. So uh, you've described two things. Uh, you described uh, back in the day there was this thing called POGO, which was a partial gravity simulator. It's very similar to what you're talking about. And so they've it, – it's exactly what you just said. It, it's kind of – it's not like a bungee thing you would do. You've seen these amusement parts. You've got – you hook the kid up to the bungee cord at their waist and they can jump a little bit. It's not okay. unlike that. It's very similar to that. And then there's another one, a more modern version that's better. It's called Argos. Um, and here's an acronym, Active Response Gravity Offload System. Now, the difference in Pogo and, and Argos, if I understand it correctly, so, so what would be the problems with uh, emulating this 5, 6 G offset? You understand why I say five-sixth offset. Do you understand that? Yeah. Low orbit. One G is Earth. One right? G is Earth, yes. So low orbit isn't the same as like just full-on space, right? Low orbit, you've still got a little bit more gravity than just out there? Or is low orbit just not gravity? Once you get into, once you get into low Earth orbit, which is what you're talking about, Mm -hmm. Basically, the simplest way to think of orbit is like if we were to fire a, a rifle parallel with the ground off the top of the Empire State Building, that thing is going to fall towards the Earth. If we neglect drag, just for the math, that thing is going to fall to the Earth at 9.8 meters per second meters squared. Meters per second squared. Yeah. Yes. It's going to be a parabolic arc. Now, once yes. it's in drag, it's a little more than a parabola, but you get the idea. Yes. So if you were to shoot that bullet faster and faster and faster so that the fall of that bullet happens to match up with the curvature of the Earth, that's orbit. Oh. That's that's all orbit is. So if you go up really, really high... So you're still trying to fall, you just can't because of the shape of the Earth. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's what orbit is. Well, huh. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so okay. if you're in low Earth orbit you feel weightless because your spaceship is falling and you're falling. You just never hit anything. That okay. is, that, that's orbit. So in low okay. Earth orbit, you're weightless. If you're on the moon, you there is gravity. There's about one-sixth as much gravity as there is here on Earth. Okay. So if you wanted to simulate the moon, which is what we did in the video, you have to offset five-sixths of your weight so that you're left with only one-sixth of your weight. So one-sixth is what feels like orbit gravity in the lived experience of a person who is in that environment. No, uh, orbit is zero gravity. And I, I'm just now realizing I confused you because when I brought you in the office and said, Whitman, I said, they're going to be weightless. And now I'm, yes, talking, you about, did. I'm talking about five-six offset. So I'm sorry about that. I'm jumping ahead. So okay, all right, all right. The point so, is, what so, what you're saying will work, and, and they have a little ride that when people come to space camp here in Huntsville, Alabama, they rig them up, and they get to climb on the inter outside of the International Space Station and do a quote spacewalk, and it it just really? takes their weight away. Yeah, the thing about Argos, which is the active, uh, it, it's this whole rig you just invented in your mind, but it's active. Now, what does active mean to you? Like, it means that it is receiving feedback from what I'm doing with my body, and it is compensating for that blazing fast in real time. It's running calculations as opposed to letting the rig just do it physically or analog. There's a digital calculation and feedback that's occurring. Exactly. In instead of like a spring or a bungee cord that would be reactive, um, an active response gravity offload system predicts what it's going to need to do based on what's happening right now. It, it has a control loop. And so okay. that control loop, you, you it, imagine under a crane, and not like a crane, like a Tonka truck-shaped crane, but like an overhead crane in a warehouse. You've seen one of these? Sure. Okay. So imagine that. So the, the crane trolley can move up, you know. X, Y, Z. Exactly. And the so, X and Y are 
on the ceiling, Z would be represented by dipping down to grab whatever it needs to grab from the floor. Exactly. And so X okay. and Y are are pretty pretty, you know, possible. But the problem is you have to move that whole trolley overhead and it has mass. And so you have mm. lag because you've got to accelerate that whole trolley system over your head. So that's okay. that's the hard part of that. But okay. anyway, my point is what you've said will work. And in fact, NASA uses that to train astronauts for for reduced gravity environments. What I described is the POGO system. The old version is the POGO. The new one is called ARGOS, A-R-G-O-S. And, and POGO stands for something. It's just one of those really fun acronyms where you make it match what it reminds you of in your brain. It's like a POGO stick. I, I think it it's just for some I, I think super it's just complicated partial gravity thing. simulator and and people just call it pogo cuz it it kind of i don't know yeah it's it's basically a it looks like an engine hoist kind of thing from the pictures i've seen i've never seen the pogo system but i have seen argos and okay. um yeah so yeah what 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 you described would work that would that would get some of it done but but there's some problems with what you've described um there's another thing you can do okay can i guess what the problems are yeah um, I, I don't. I don't know a lot about Argos and, and uh, Pogo. I mean, that's not something I'm great well, at. So we'll I would think the Pogo system would work pretty well as long as the astronaut in training is basically upright. But as I learned in Ender's Game, there isn't really down in space, and so I would think inversion would require require like a series of gyroscopic rings that could move inside, but then you have actual gravity working against you in different ways that would feel unnatural and would not simulate zero gravity. And there's really nothing you can do to simulate the inversion without an active system. So I would think the Argos system would do better at getting you oriented to being in an environment where there is no up or down in reality, but... Yeah, I, I don't know. I that's the only problem I can think of. That's the only limitation that immediately springs to mind for me. I I think it would be difficult to design it. Like I'm I'm imagining trapeze artists, these aerial acrobats, and they have the bar. Yeah. Or in gymnastics, when they do the you know the what is it the split bar thing? You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I think you could flip over that stuff. So I, I can imagine them mounting an astronaut uh, spacesuit in a yoke, and you could just flip over front or back. But I think it'd be very hard to move in the cartwheel axis. I think that would be difficult. Yeah, I could see that. I, okay. I think it would be difficult. I, I'm sure the engineers are smart and, and they figure that out. So yeah, you, you're right. That's one way to do it. There's another way that's really, really cool that I got to do one time a long time ago. I think I told you about it. Do you remember what the other way is? If you were going to simulate reduced gravity? Upside down and inside <laughs> out, we're going to feel it. Ta -ta 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 -ta. What you is that? The, uh, the OK Go song? Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, they did a video with your uh, your zero g plane drop thing, right? Yeah, I think that's the song even that goes with the video. I don't, I, upside something like that. It's it's really it's a fantastic cool. video. The vomit comet, yeah, or the there you know, we go company that's, called yeah, zero g. So thing. basically, what they do is they take an airplane and they just start pointing up, and then they just kind of go over the hump. And so basically, you're you're pointing up at the sky at a forty five degree angle or something like that, and then you just nose over the airplane. And then you start going over, and then and then down. And the cool thing is, because you're decent, you, like you're you're pushing the nose of the plane forward, you're weightless, or you can fly any parabola you want. You can get a one sixth g or a one third g. You can do whatever. You're weightless as you're still going up in the airplane. So you think to yourself, oh, you're just gonna go really high, and then you're gonna nose dive it down towards the ground, and you'll be weightless the whole time you're falling, and then you'll pull up before you hit the ground. That's not how it works at all. You're pointing up, and then you're pointing up, pointing up, and then nose over, and then you're weightless from there all the way over the hump until until you start pulling the nose up again halfway through. The like if you were to graph y equals sine x, it would be at all where where that curve crosses zero. Those are the points where you're in either zero g or two g because you're you're pushing over okay, or so you're pulling back. Two g is. So you start in your correction. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can see all of that. I've never really understood how that worked or when you would get the experience. So it's like 30 seconds that you get on the upper part of the parabola. Exactly. That's the limitation. So okay. if you got if you got something you want to, I don't know, test, 
how do you do that? So let's right. say you want to test, which is what I got to observe. You want to test a next generation astronaut spacesuit walking in lunar soil at one sixth G. How would you do that? Okay, I'm still struggling with the five sixth one sixth thing. I'm sorry, I'm out of my depth here. One sixth G is moon gravity. It just, that's just sixteen point seven percent of what I would be used to here. Correct. Yeah. Does that mean that if I have a four inch vertical leap, which might be what it's down to at this point, <laughs> that I would then have like a, a twenty inch vertical leap? Is it just is it all just linear like that in terms of how you modify everything out or I'd how ha things will respond? That's a great question. I, I, I don't know how muscles ball. I don't know how muscles work. And so I would 16 have sixteen yards, now I can throw it a hundred. I don't know the answer to that. That's great. That's a great question. But um okay. I do know that that it's different than you think. And so I'm sure it is different uh, well, than I think. Well, well, that does it, not surprise me. It's different than I thought as well. I, I thought, oh, you're in 1.6G. Everything, everything is easier to jump, easier to throw. But there's another component I didn't think about, and that's inertia. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, okay. I want to set the stage for what I got to do, which was amazing, if that's cool. I'm sorry. I've got one more question for you. Okay. So 1.6G is the moon, but you were simulating... Zero in the Vomit Comet, right? Correct. Okay. But the Pogo system or Argos system, you could simulate zero or you could simulate one-sixth, depending on what the Pogo system, tension of the, the physical feedback, the springs or whatever. With the Argos system, you would just dial in the active feedback to simulate the gravity you want to simulate. Vomit Comet, you kind of get 2G or zero, correct? Because you're oscillating on either side of one. You can you can fly a different parabola, and so oh okay yeah so instead of taking away instead of decelerating at nine point eight meters per second squared, you can decelerate it, you know eighty five percent of that, and then you can create a one sixth g parabola, and so you can have, you know you, you take away most of the gravity but not all of it. In fact, when when I got to do this as an undergraduate, we flew our twenty parabolas for our experiment. And then at the end, they flew a lunar parabola, and then they flew a Martian parabola, which I think the way they do that, really? yeah, it was awesome. What what is Martian gravity? Uh, it's I I pulled it up here. It's about thirty eight percent of the gravity on Earth. It's three point seven one meters per second squared. So, I knew that when I was watching the Expanse, but I don't remember it anymore. So okay, man, all right, I okay. Watch the Expanse. Now I'm tracking with all of that. Final question for the setup run here, so I understand what I'm learning about. You're talking about old generation of spacesuit. You're talking about next generation. What was wrong with the old stuff? Why are we updating it? What does the new one do that's better? Well, the Apollo system, you know, that, that's a really old spacesuit. Then we had a newer one, a, a newer spacesuit that's being used right now up on the ISS. Think about it. They're, they're not made to walk. Because if you're doing a, a an EVA and extravehicular activity on this the ISS, you're just using your hands and you're like moving around all over. It's not like you're Spider Man. You don't have to like grapple to it because you're weightless. You oh, can just yeah. hold yourself and move yourself with your pinky, right? And so there's no like if you look at the boots on the ones of the ISS, they're like hard plastic. They're not made for walking, and so hmm. they don't have to worry about space dust. They don't have to worry about like regolith. The lunar soil is called regolith. They don't have to okay. worry about that getting up in the sleeves and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, it's a completely different thing. Also, they, they've learned some lessons over the years, and it's pretty hard to put that, that thing on. The, the cool thing about this episode is years ago, I was allowed to put on a spacesuit at NASA, uh, Johnson, Johnson Space Center. So what we did is I was there this is back when I was making some videos with Smarter Every Day, and they said, hey, we've got time. I might be able to get you into this astronaut, like, anthropomorphic study where we're, we're measuring people's bodies, and then we put them in the spacesuit, like, to get more data. Like, you're this big, you weigh this much, your forearm is this long, and they, they took all these measurements. They're like, oh, okay, you need this, this, and this part of these spacesuits, and then they 
Lego you a spacesuit together, and then you get in it, and uh, it was cool. I got to do that. And so that was super, super awesome, and uh, I did it years ago, and so I got to finally use that footage because I, I didn't want to release it prior to now because back in the day I was like really excited about wanting to be an astronaut, and so I didn't think it made sense to release that that video because it felt too self-centered. Does that make sense? You've got a video of, you know, you well, you know, in your what heart, do you, you mean? Be... I mean, that seems normal enough. That I mean, that's a really cool experience. I don't understand how that would be uh, self-centered. I guess I don't know, man. There's, you know, you know that you and I at one point in time we decided to turn a camera on and point it at our face and then upload that to the internet. Yes, I I remember that. What like at some level. Like you thought that was a good idea, right? <laughs> At some level, I did. Uh, yeah, I think there was. There's a degree of humility in that exercise. There's also a degree of pride in that exercise. Right. There's a white wolf and there's a black wolf in my soul, and whichever one I feed more, that one more informs why I'm turning on the camera. And obviously, light and dark in that scenario is a reference to, you know, the. Ideas of where the light shines and where the light does not shine. Like the ancient ideas of yin and yang and balance and all of that stuff. I don't know. I'm, I'm overthinking it. I'm over communicating it. Just simply put, yes, cameras do weird things to your soul. And if you're the one in charge of what you film and what you say and what you edit and what you show people and what you don't, there's a temptation to try to make yourself look cool and have it be all about you. Right. So I get that. That make yourself look cool thing. So there was a shot that I had in there of, and, and keep in mind, I want to be an astronaut kind of thing. There's a shot of him putting an astronaut helmet on your head and latching it, and you start breathing. And I'm not filming that. Somebody else is filming that. And I was like, man, there's no way I'm putting this on the internet. This is just too, it's too much. You know, I don't know. It felt like too much. Self-serving? Yeah, it did. Like, like it would flip the point of the video from being about the person watching to being about you? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It was weird. I, I couldn't, I don't know. It was just strange. So anyway, um, but okay. that- Was it heavy? What was the suit like? Did super it, heavy. Just weigh a crap ton? Super heavy. Yeah, absolutely. There's a backpack called a Pliss, a uh, portable life support system. That thing was crazy heavy. And so I had to walk. They, you know, they they mount the the hard upper torso. They, they mount you to that. And then you like climb up through it. It's very difficult. And then you put the pants on. And then they put the helmet on and the glove. It's just a very difficult thing to get into by yourself. They got some kind of tube on your thingy so you can pee while you're in there, or you have to go in for a bathroom break. How's that work? So Apollo did. Uh, Apollo did have the, the urine system. It was it's like a little rubbery condomy type thing, and it would it would you would pee into that, and then that would go into a little bag. And uh, they they came in three sizes. Do you, do you want to guess what the sizes were? Uh, I'm going to go with large, extra large, and extra, extra large. It was actually humongous is the word they used. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come on, you're trying to, you're depending on these people to operate very sophisticated, expensive machinery in space. Other people's lives depend on it. You can't have them second guessing themselves or their competency level. Yeah. Large, yeah. extra large, and humongous. Well done, NASA. Yeah, my, Michael Collins in his uh, book, he was talking about that. And uh, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, instead of small, medium, large, it was large, gigantic, and humongous. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Now, they, uh, in that spacesuit that they're using now on station, they, they use what's called a mag, a, a maximum absorbent garment. It's basically a diaper. And really? uh, I was offered the diaper to, you know, hey, do you want to, the astronauts wear a mag. Do you want to do that? And I was like, no, thank you. And I really wish I had done it. But I did. You should have taken it and peed in it. I know, right? Exactly. Why not? I That's know. the astronaut experience. Yeah, I know. <laughs> exactly. So, so the thing I was invited to do was go to the NBL, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, which is this other way to, to do weightlessness, which is basically you get in water and okay. they trim you out with weights. And because you're in a spacesuit that has air in it, you float. And so you. Have you ever been scuba diving? I have. So, but now we're to new suits. Yeah, we're we're These in new are suits, smaller they're, and lighter than what you tried on, I assume, because newer things tend to be smaller and lighter, or still huge. They're just better in in several ways. They they have they have shoes made for walking. They have 
what's called a rear entry. So they have a hatch on the back and you can climb in it. It's, it's something you can actually get into by yourself. Hmm. Um, it's You really need people to help you. I guess in theory... Like getting you, into a mech. Yeah, yeah, kind of like the... The Orlon, which I believe is the Russian suit, it, it was rear entry. The The Russians designed a rear entry suit years ago, and you supposedly can get in there and like throw this lever and you latch yourself in. Like The problem cool. is sealing yourself in there, right? Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Don't want to get that wrong? No, I don't think so. I, I don't think you would want to. So the, the new one, the XEMU, which is the name of the new government suit. So th there's a contract recently that, that went out, and so there's two companies, uh, I believe it's Axiom and, and ILC Dover, they're, they're making new spacesuits. They have the contract to do that. But in the meantime, NASA made a government suit. This is the XEMU. And the purpose of the XEMU is to gather data. Like, we're going to just come up with all this data on how these suits work, what pressures are best, and all these things. And then we're going to give that data to the contractors making these suits. Which I think right. is interesting. So that brings us to the big picture, the neutral buoyancy lab, and you getting to try this out, and you're wearing one of the XEMU suits in there? No, sir. I, I didn't wear the suit. I was allowed to scuba dive with the astronauts that were wearing the suits because the astronauts were testing a, a very interesting thing. They were testing the pressure of the suits. But before we get to that... You said you've okay. been scuba diving? Uh, I have. Yeah, not a ton. I mean, I've snorkeled a ton. I love that activity. But a little bit of scuba diving. I had a buddy who was into it, and he taught me how it worked, and I learned, and I made some mistakes, and I did okay, and it was really neat. Did you learn how to control your ability to float in the water? Like, do you know what a BCD is, a buoyancy control device? Do you remember that? I remember that. Uh yeah, it's been a while. Walk me through it. Bring me up to speed. Like a floaty vest. Do you remember wearing a floaty vest and you could hit a button and go, choo, 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 and you could pump air into it? I do remember that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the deeper you go in water, the more pressure there is on you, right? Sure. And if you have an air bubble with you and you take it down, it's going to shrink. And when you sure. shrink, your volume gets smaller, and so your density goes up. And so what can okay. happen is this really weird thing. When you're descending uh, with a scuba diving rig, as you go down further, your vest can start to shrink and you start to sink faster. So it's this really strange thing that happens. And so it, it's kind of counterintuitive. And so when you're coming up the other way, I think you and I have, have spoken about this before. There's this, let's say you're at the bottom of the pool and you take a big breath and you hold your breath. If you were to swim towards the surface, with your breath, you're holding your breath, what would happen? Hmm. I I think it I feel it like it pressures down with that. If I swim toward the surface with a full breath. Yes. Yeah, I feel like that pressure's down. It would blow you up. You would explode. Well, not from like six feet underwater. Not from six feet underwater, no. But like, if you go to the bottom of forty to a hundred feet or something like that, you take a breath. <sighs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. So when I take a breath, okay. Sorry, I'm tracking with scenario now. So let's say we're in the twelve foot range. Okay. And I take a breath and I go down. I feel that compression. Yes. I feel my shoulders wanting to roll in, <laughs> and the the relationship between my body and my lung capacity feels cramped. It feels different. So you were asking me to imagine getting the breath somehow magically 12 feet below water and then going up with it. Am I understanding? Yes. With a scuba regulator. I'm sorry. I wasn't yeah. clear about okay. that. Yeah. 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 Now I've never experienced that. I didn't go very deep in my little bit of training and goofing around that I did, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, that would hurt as I came up. I would expect. Yeah. Have you ever seen a fish? You, you've probably seen this deep sea fish. And if you've ever seen a fish with their swim bladder, like all puffed up, have you ever seen that? Yeah, I had to trident uh, koi recently to uh, euthanize it. What? Its swim bladder <laughs> became damaged. It's a tough deal, man. We had a fish named Blubber, lived in the backyard <laughs> in the koi pond. We inherited him. I didn't, it's not even my fish. I got him from the previous owners. They've had this fish since 
the eighties. I don't know. It was a very old fish. He had all the cancers, all the fish diseases you could have. He had all of them, but somehow he just didn't die. Right. Well, I go out there last season and, uh, it's over. He can't, he just can't control it. So I give him food. I was down there. I was like trying to push the little food pellets into his mouth. Like, come on, blubber. My kids love you. <laughs> come on, blubber, pull through. But I mean, he's 80% cancer at this point. There's a little bit of fish left, but it's mostly just disease. And he's just flipping over, rolling over. I'm in the water with him trying to prop him up. There are tricks when the swim bladder gets deflated from pressure or stress with a trout where you can you can get them righted by moving water along the gills and holding them at a certain angle. You can get that bladder functioning right again. You can get it, their equilibrium back. Is it back. normally too big or is it too small, the swim bladder? Uh, well. I don't know how a fish swim bladder works. I would think it's works. too small. I, I would think it would be too small in my experience <laughs> because usually if I see a swim bladder that's too low, I'm fishing with a new fisherman and they're freaked out by the fish mm. and they over clinch it. Oh. And the fish goes, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, good. You're doing a good job. That's great. Why don't I put that one back for you? And so to me, it looks like they <laughs> squeeze the air out of the poor thing. And I imagine that as I work it against the current in the most oxygenated part of the flow, I'm getting air back into the swim bladder. But I don't know the anatomy of fish, dude. I just know that it works. And then eventually when they feel right, you can feel the tense up in their flanks and their musculature, and that means I'm right again. I can swim, and off the trout goes. Blubber, there was no such tensing. I think where the muscles were, it was just cancer and bloat, and I worked that fish over and over. I'm, you know, I fired up some air bubblers, and I got the little like aquarium oh, really? air bubbler right underneath him. I'm you like, did, you, try, you attempted fish CPR? Basically, take all that air, buddy. What about all this air? Are you hungry? Here's some more fish it, pellets. It's a I'm fish. Putting... He needs water. Yeah, well, I had... There was... He was getting water, too, because he was in water. Oh, I it see. seemed like he had plenty of all... It, it just okay. wasn't working. He's a bobber. He was dead. It was over. <laughs> so I tried that for a couple of days without t- telling the kids, and finally I was like, ah, it's over for Blubber. The dude's dead. He can't... I, he's maybe the tiniest bit alive, but it's over. How big, how big is Blubber? Blubber's a big koi. Maybe... Uh, Eight inches? Did you get him mounted? Pretty, pretty big coin. No, although I did get a trout. My, my Camilla got me the biggest trout I ever caught just yesterday. We got we got it. It's on the wall. I'll, I'll show you a picture. It's awesome. Really? Great, big, fatty rainbow. Yeah, it's on the wall. It's above the... Is this the thing now the where you don't chair. actually have to keep the fish? You just take the pictures from a certain angle and then they can do it? Yes. Dude, I, maybe we should do a whole conversation about this, but I'm cool telling you real quick. There is a guy in Hot Springs, South Dakota. It's about an hour south of here. Camilla looked him up online. Dude is amazing. I went to his workshop yesterday. I saw how he does everything. It is amazing. But we went in there. He's like, well, show me the fish that you want to do. And I took a ton of pictures because I knew this service existed and I might want to do it someday. I showed him all my pictures. He's like, oh yeah, it's more than enough. No problem. And he pulls out this big digital catalog and he's like, uh, all right, you measured it. And yeah, I showed him me measuring the fish. He's like, all right, it's a 23-inch trout, really good girth on it. It's all footballed up. He's like, all right, right here, this is the model. And there are like 10 different fiberglass plastic what? models of exactly the dimensions of the fish I caught. And he just had me pick the pose I wanted. I was like, yeah, I bet it struck that pose right there at one point in its life. And I put it back. It's still alive. It's out there in nature somewhere. And he's like, all right, well, just, you know, give me the highest res version of the photos possible. And I'll paint it to look exactly like this fish. The spots, the speckles. What? The depth of the gill cuts, the color around the gills, the life in the eyeballs, everything. And then I'll make a little rock base for it. I got the thing back. It's a spitting image in my hands. It sits in my hands, just like the picture of me holding this fish up out of the water. It's a two-hander. And it's just the most amazing thing ever. The guy's an absolute artistic genius. And now that fish lives on my wall, and I haven't decided what the fish's name shall be yet, but it shall have a name. And someday, <laughs> my children and grandchildren shall inherit it and be like, that is what our eccentric grandpa did, and now we have his fish for some reason. Well, I, I think we should workshop names real quick. 
I think we should too. What do you have in mind? Is it a is it a boy or a girl? I think it's a boy, but boy? I'm gonna I'm gonna verify. But yeah, let's assume boy. How did he make you feel? How did it make me feel? What a thoughtful question. Elated? Oh. I, I was just okay, this is what happened with this fish. I walked up to a clear stretch of water and I had a, a whole gallery with me. There were a bunch of people on the trail. My my three kids, my wife were there, and her parents were there. My father-in-law is a spin fisherman who likes to catch trout, but does not like fly fishing. And he performs very well, often outperforms me with his lures and spinners and all of this. And so I walked up to this particular pool. He didn't have a rod out. I did have mine. And I've got this teeny tiny little fly on there. And we walked up and both of us were like, well, dang, that's the one you'd want to get right there. So I was like, all right, uh, let me see if I can show you how this is supposed to work. Well, the fly rod, we got to wait and we got to watch at this low angle so he can't see us, but we can we can see him. We need to see how he's feeding, Snell's what he's window. eating, yeah. and where the food is coming to him from. Yeah, 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 exactly that. The angle of refraction that mm -hmm. would defeat the fish's ability to see you. And so we watched, we looked at what bugs were floating on the water. We evaluated exactly how the fish was feeding. I decided, well, I have more or less what I would want already on, tied onto my line, so I don't need to change flies. I just need to drop it upstream here and nurse it so that it follows the current here because he seems to like things that are coming down exactly that way. But I have to manage my rod so he doesn't see it, but there's no slack. It's too old a fish. You're not going to get a fish that old if you've got a bunch of line in the water. The fly needs to be the only thing on the water coming downstream and so my cast was good i liked where it hit everybody's all crouched down my whole family including my in-laws who are not super young and i cruised it right into his strike zone i saw him snap his tail one time which means oh i'm in hunting mode watching watching i'm like he's gonna hit he's gonna hit he's gonna hit sure enough boom came up and rolled on it just the way you would hope i set the hook it was a long long fight and I won. I got him in the net. I got him to shore. And then I he's so big, you can't, I mean, he's exhausted when you defeat a fish that big. So you got to keep him in the net, in the current. So I was kind of in the water with him, making sure that I wouldn't kill this beautiful animal. And so the couple of shots where I lift him up out of the water for pictures, I was elated because I picked the fish I wanted. I wanted to try to show my father-in-law that this kind of fishing is legitimate and actual and you know it's credible. And it worked on the first cast. We got the fish we wanted. My kids were excited. Yeah, my wife kind of had that take me, take me now look in her eyes. Which is I'm great. sure she and did. Then, yeah, absolutely. That didn't happen at all. I completely made that part up. She was, you know, only moderately impressed. But I was elated. It was exactly the fish I wanted. That's how I felt. So what does that mean the name should be? Oh, I, I mean, I've got a few suggestions. Okay. Do um, most of them start with Darth? No. <laughs> is he... Uh... Is he a good fish or a bad fish? Like, is is he more evil or more good? Like, is he? He's more, a great is, fish. So he's more of a Jedi, less of a Sith. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'd like to say we're friends. Okay, so so Goliath is out. Goliath yeah, is out. Too yeah. negative. Yes, yeah, negative. So uh, you said he snapped the water. What about Snappy? <laughs> Ooh, well, I mean, that would describe the action he took. <laughs> What are we doing? <laughs> Dr. Dr. Snapples. Oh, that's good. Lieutenant Snappleton. Ooh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. Snapples. That's great. <laughs> what if we keep workshopping that at another time? Okay, I don't think let's... we're, I just, it doesn't feel. It doesn't feel. Like we're quite there yet. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll keep working. So, I, such a long story short now. Blubber, he was done. I decided, like, he's deceased. The fish is dead. Goodbye to this beautiful koi. You've been a good friend of the family. I will now bury you in the garden, and you will become part of the food we will later eat. Aw. Thank you. Thanks, Your gift Blubber. continues. So, yes, yeah, the giving fish. So I dug a little hole. I took his body out, and I set it in the little hole, and he starts going, bah, bah, bah. I'm like, well, dang it. You buried him he's alive? He's not dead. Yeah. I'm not going to bury him alive. Okay. 
So I'm That's like, well, it. I need to run him through with something. I gotta put him out of here. Get him. <laughs> like he, like he's done. The fish is done, man. I know when a fish is done. But I don't want to club my fish to death. And I was like, well, what do you, what do you kill a fish with? And I'm like, you kill a fish with a trident. Yeah. No, oh, there's no trident. Oh, wait, there is a trident because we had a thing that you stick in the garden for a sprinkler that had a trident on the end. Oh. So just out there in my backyard, I just took the three-pronged trident. I stood over him. I thought some kind thoughts. And I just sort of pressed the middle tine of the trident into his cancer. Was it like the knife fighting <laughs> scene in Saving Private Ryan? Only with <laughs> blubber and you? <laughs> Dude, that's so dark. Actually, it was exactly like that. And I just... just, And he was like... Yeah. 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 And then I buried blubber, and now he is part of the food we grow in our garden. And he that, will be missed. He's a wonderful fish. That's a great story. Thank you for that, Matt. You bet. This episode of No Dumb Questions is brought to you by the patrons. Those are the people who took a look at this situation. We're like, hey, I like that podcast and it's free and I don't have to pay for it at all. What if I did anyway? I really appreciate that equation that you ran. Thank you. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, let's let's go truth again, right? So we are motivated to get an episode done right now because. Yes. Yeah. The patron, like the patrons, not only paid for this, they they told us to do it. They slapped us on the hand, like, "Hey, do it." No kidding. I, it is eight forty seven p.m. where you live. It is seven forty seven p.m. where I live, and I had a wonderful Easter Sunday with my family. We got up early. We did church stuff. We had a great dinner. We played games. Wonderful day, and. I came down to publish the podcast and you and I touched base and we were like, well, it's hot crap. We shouldn't publish that at all. Why would we put that milky sludge on the internet and forever besmirch our name and bore our listeners? They're nice to us. We shouldn't do that. So we had two options before us, a fork in the road, if you will. Fork option number one was, I would just don't do anything. Punt. Eh. Didn't work out. We missed on that one. Just didn't get to where we wanted it, and we're out of time, whatever. Option number two was, yeah, but the the Patreon thing's quite the motivation, and this is the last day of the month. Yeah. It, we should do that. This this is actually really helps our families. And... Which tells you how bad that other episode was. So we climbed <laughs> Mount Mordor, and we cast it into the volcano. <laughs> it's where it's going to stay. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, oh, yeah. thank you very much, patrons, for supporting the podcast. We are severely grateful. And uh, if you want to check that out, go to patreon.com slash no dumb questions. And I think we're going to start doing the conversation over there, right? We are. Yeah, I'm going to figure that out in the upcoming month, and we'll let people know how to do it. But more or less, we're going to make it so that anybody, I mean, you don't even have to like pay or contribute, but... Anybody can be a free member or a, a paid member of Patreon. And we're just going to move the conversation over there because I like the culture on Patreon better. There's a bunch of a bunch of you who are awesome who are on Reddit and on Reddit frequently. But eh, I don't want to force people who want to talk about the program to have to spend time on Reddit when I think that could have positive or maybe negative impacts on a person's life so we'll just move it over to patreon and let everybody participate whether they're a patron or not yeah i think so patreon.com slash no dumb questions thank you so much for uh encouraging our conversations as friends I, th I think it's great i really enjoy it and we always say stuff like hey this exists because of you but hey, no look me in the eye right now please i'm looking you in the eye. if you are a patron <laughs> this actually does exist entirely because of you so if you hated this episode, blame the patrons. But if this was fun for you, and it's been very fun for me, thank a patron. <laughs> so what we're going to talk today about tridenting fish, right? Like no. household pets, tridenting household pets. Now, to tie all that together, there's some <laughs> divers do. at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, and they okay. all have tattoos, and most of them have tridents on them. Really? Yeah, they do. So oh, Well, that worked out better than expected. But I think you asked me about swim bladders, right? Yeah, so so basically, when you go really deep in water, there's this cool thing that happens. The air gets smaller, 
And so there's this really cool thing that I think you and I have talked about before called a CISA, a Controlled Emergency Swimming Ascent. So if you go Oh, to the, yes. Yeah, 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 I didn't know that was the term. Yeah, you go to the bottom, you take a breath out of your, you know, your regulator, and it's a pressurized breath because you're under so much pressure at the bottom that that's why you have those big tanks on your back as a scuba diver. You take okay. this pressurized breath, and then you can just open your mouth and go, ah, and you can swim up and your breath will never run out. What? Yes. No, I didn't know that's how it worked. I've heard you talk about that before. I had no idea that's how it worked. That's how it works. So basically, and, you, and you, that's that's an emergency maneuver. It's an emergency maneuver because you've heard of the bends. Like you can, so, yeah, it's a nitrogen poisoning basically from yeah. rapid so, ascent, inappropriately rapid ascent. Yeah. So if you go to the bottom of the pool and you start breathing air, then what can happen is the the nitrogen can absorb in your tissue and your in your blood and your like. Everything you, you can just absorb nitrogen in your synovial fluid, I think is how you say it, like in your joints and stuff like that. And so, if you swim up too fast, if you ascend too quickly, then you'll end up like blubber. You'll get oh, uh, or maybe trident. Yeah, you'll you'll end up with your you know basically the nitrogen will boil out of your blood, but it's not quite as violent as it sounds. But anyway, that's the same effect. Bad things happen. Okay. They call it the bends because you're bending over in pain. Okay. And, yeah. And so anyway, uh, you want to avoid that. And so at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, they said, hey, we're going to do these new spacesuit tests, and we're going to do a blind test where they run the spacesuit itself at a certain pressure. And so they said, hey, we're going to run the space. The spacesuit is 4.3 PSI or whatever it was, but it might be running at 6.2 PSI. We don't know. And I'm like, well, why would you want to run it at a higher pressure? Because when I tried on the spacesuit years ago and I put my hand in the glove, as soon as they pressurize the spacesuit, it's like being inside of a balloon. And so imagine a balloon the shape of your hand. Now imagine it's pressurized, and now imagine trying to close your hand. You can see that you'd be fighting the balloon, right? How much real estate is there between your flesh and your balloon hand? In fact, they put a foam block on the back of your wrist to push your hand into the palm of, of the glove. Like hmm. that's, a, that's a very good question that you just asked because they have to think about it. And they also put a metal bar over the front of your palm. So, so you're kind of in there. You, you've got a foam block on the back of your wrist and you've got a metal bar on the palm, and it's pushing you so that your fingers are engaged with the glove. Make sense? Yes. Yeah, yeah good description. Okay, I get it. So how much pressure would you want in your suit? Like what, you know, I just told you it's either four or six, but like, would you think you'd want more pressure or less pressure? What Four think, or six of what unit? Did you say PSI? PSI, yeah, pounds per square inch. So uh, would, would you want, <laughs> Dude, I, I couldn't even. Would you want more or less pressure in your suit because of this balloon hand? What would be easier to say? Well, I would think I would want more because all my movements would translate clumsily, albeit. They would translate to the outside with more pressure, but I could get more precision movement with a smaller suit and a smaller bubble at a lower pressure where there's just a little bit more ability to engage with the material. I, I could see an advantage to both. Yeah, yeah if, if you have the, the tighter the pressure, the, you know, basically the more pressure in the suit, the more the suit will fight against you on your hands. So your hands can get really tired. So they really have to design those hands, or, or excuse me, the gloves, so that they can close easily because you're fighting that pressure. It's called a Every joint, the the goal for the joints are to be a zero work joint, meaning uh, the the physics equation for work is pressure times delta volume, and so you want to make it so that when you extend your elbow or or close your elbow, you're not changing the volume of the suit at all. Does that make sense? Wow, I had not even thought of that, but it makes infinite sense. Exactly. Yeah, I mean. Humans articulate in, I mean, what's the number? A hundred different ways with all the little things that we can bend. Every one of those is a change in pressure in part of the suit. Oh, wow. I'd never thought about that complication 
at all. So you're oh, okay. So you're suggesting that what they're trying to do is make it so that no matter what you articulate, the pressure remains uniform throughout the suit in the envelope, the air envelope. Is that, am I hearing yeah, you right? Yeah, a constant volume joint is the goal. Like, and in, in think about building a, a CBT, s- controlled variable transmission, a CB. Oh, joint, CBJ. <laughs> Okay, I got it. I got it. Yeah, a constant volume joint, not a, a constant velocity joint, which is a thing in the car. I, oh, yeah. okay, great. Yeah. But but I basically imagine building a suit of armor so that all the elbows and and knees and stuff bend without. Uh, it would be a hard thing to do, right? Then you have to get Very. A, an O ring in every one of those joints, and it would just be challenging. So I I didn't understand why they were test. They said, hey, we're going to do this test in. It's possible that we're going to run it at a higher pressure or a lower pressure. We're not going to tell the astronauts what they're testing. We're just going to put them in the suit and say, "Hey, you're on the moon. Go walk around on the moon." And we're gonna we're gonna trim out your buoyancy with weights strapped to your legs and stuff, and foam blocks strapped to your back in very specific locations. And that's kind of what the video that I made is about: is like how they get those locations right. Not an interesting topic for right now, though. So basically, they get these astronauts. Perfected, perfectly trimmed out, put them in the water, and they say, okay, go do all these tasks. And then they say, how tired are you? And it's a blind test. They don't tell the astronaut what pressure they're at. And it's like, I don't know, I'm a 4 out of 10 tired at the end? I don't know. Uh, how easy was that task? It was a ah, it was a 3 out of 10. And so there's these, there's these you know, subjective type, um, is, is that the correct way of, I always get that confused, subjective yeah, and objective. Yeah, subjective. Yeah, so you're having to give a guess of how hard something is. Mm-hmm. And the problem is, when you're doing it, you've got another astronaut sitting right beside you. And if if you and I pick up a, a block and somebody says, hey, hey, Matt, how hard was it to pl- pick up that block? One yeah, out of for ten. me, it's going to be like, oh, super easy. And for you, it's going to be really taxing. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> So there's a little bit of competition going on. So if I say like, well, this block was about a four and then like, okay, uh, astronaut Whitman, uh, what was that for you? One. Yeah. <laughs> like a negative one. I don't know. It just, uh, it's because of all like my moved it with my mind. <laughs> exactly. So it's a hard test to run, but, uh, but they do it. But what I didn't understand is like, why, why in the heck would you want the suit to have more pressure? If, the human body is happy to operate at four psi. By the way, the atmosphere you're in right now, I, I'm in fourteen point seven psi or a little bit less. You are. What's your altitude where you're at? I'm at about seven hundred feet here. Where are you at? Um, we're on the. We're kind of going up the hill here in Rapid City, so three thousand ish. Oh wow! Wow. Not like Wyoming, where I mean, in Lander, we were solidly at a mile. Oh wow! You probably have way more hemoglobin than I do. That's, that's yeah. I was gonna say that, and <laughs> I was always afraid of hobgoblins growing up. But you know the the hemoglobin. Globa, yep. What is that? White blood cells. Hemo. It's the red ones. How do you say it? Hemoglobin. He- hemoglobin. I think. Yeah. So that's the oxygen saturated yeah. cells. Yeah. Yeah. You have more red blood cells to transport. Oxygen. Yeah. Oh, do. the white ones are the ones that uh, they fight the bad stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. They've this got is the... seriously eighth grade health. I haven't covered this. <laughs> I was a child, so I don't remember. So the okay, thing, the whole purpose of the test was fascinating to me because because I wait, said, how do you know you just know your psi off the top of your head? For some reason, that's I mean, well, one atmosphere. For some reason, I re- I remember all these numbers. It's seventeen hundred sixty tor. I think it's one hundred one. 0.325 kilopascals. It's 14.7 psi. And was was the other ones? I don't know. There's more. But for some reason, I got really excited about one atmosphere of pressure and just memorized a bunch of it. 29.92 inches of mercury. I think that's right. Or maybe Dang, it's, dude. It's you know how else. many kilopascals? I didn't know there was a kilopascal. <laughs> I, so I don't know. Pretty, that's pretty good. And you get the things that you memorize. You could tell me when did when did Israel fall to uh, Nebuchadnezzar. When was that? 586 BC. Okay, yeah. So you know this stuff. When did Darius okay. take over approximately? Yeah, 520, give or take. See, yeah, you know these things. I, I don't know that stuff. So anyway, um, the test they were running was fascinating. They said, ideally, when astronauts go to the moon with Artemis, 
we could run them at a higher pressure. And I said, why would you want to do that? Because that, that makes it harder for the glove thing. You know, I, mm -hmm. I remember this from years ago. And they said, oh, well, it, it will decrease the pre-breathe time. I said, what? Uh, what does that term mean? Yeah, basically, right now, on the International Space Station, and people don't realize this, if they go do a spacewalk, you think, oh, they're going to put on a spacesuit, and then they're going to go out the airlock, and then they're going to go, you know, like, move around on the outside of the space station. Yeah, duh. Yep, sure. Except that's not exactly how it works. You you start by putting a mask on your face. It looks like an oxygen mask in a, in a hospital. Okay. And you breathe 100% pure oxygen for like two and a half hours or two hours or something like that. You have to do what's called pre-breathing because you have to get all that nitrogen out of your blood. Because on the space station, they're at 14.7 PSI. They have more pressure inside the space station than you do where you're at right now. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And so But that but they're picking that. Yeah. They get to select that. They pick that number. And so why it, are they picking that number? It makes sense because if the goal of the International Space Station is to be a lab and we are trying to test microgravity, then you would want the only different variable to be gravity, right? And so you would want to pretend, sure. oh, like we're we're at you know, we're at one atmosphere. You would want to pretend that. And so basically they said, we're, we're going to do that at 14.7 PSI. And then after that, we'll, we'll see what happens. The interesting thing is Apollo, when Neil and Buzz went to the moon, they were at five PSI, but it was way more oxygen. Like right now, do you, do you happen to know the percentage of oxygen uh, in, in one atmosphere? If you had to guess, zero to a hundred percent, how how much of the air you're breathing would you say is probably oxygen? Of just like oxygen, like like O two, not like correct, including CO two. Yes, so CO two is very very minimal. Nitrogen, argon. Um, let's say oxygen is eighty two percent. Backwards, you, you you're thinking about nitrogen. So oxygen is like twenty one percent. Oh, nitrogen's a big contributor. Ni nitrogen's the big one. Uh, again, eighth grade science, I don't remember that. The the thing that I thought was interesting is when the Apollo guys go into the uh, into the thing, they have like 100% oxygen. And so you've got 5 PSI in the Apollo like lunar lander, but it's almost okay. all oxygen, which is scary because oxygen helps things burn, right? Oh, that I know. Yep. Yeah. And so imagine being in like a spacecraft with 100% oxygen. If you were in that environment at 14.7 psi at, at one atmosphere, like everything around you is dangerous. Everything is fuel. It's like all rocket fuel. And like, holy cow, this this thing wants to kill me. But once you decrease the 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 pressure. Everything changes. I mean, it's it's like a, a balance. And so what they're trying to do is they say, okay, right now, these astronauts, they're, they're in a spacecraft. If they need to go do a spacewalk, they have to pre-breathe oxygen for like two hours, and then we put them in the spacesuit. And then they have to do like exercise in the spacesuit and get ready. It takes like three and a half hours wow. for, for them to... Like if you say... Hey, we're on the moon. Um, the the FedEx moon guy just rang the doorbell to bring us our moon package. Let's go open the door and greet the FedEx moon guy. It would take you three and a half hours to be able to do that because if you depressurize really, really quickly and you just go from like a high pressure environment to mm -hmm. boom to like something like four PSI, then you would get the bends. Like it's like, it's just like, Blubber. Well, not really blubber because he was hanging out in the backyard. But like if you're at the bottom of a pool and you go up really, really fast, you get the bends. If if you've if you've been like saturated with nitrogen because you've been down in the bottom of the pool so long. And so doing a spacewalk is like being at the bottom of a pool and swimming up. And so you have to constantly think about how much nitrogen saturation is okay. in your body. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Three things very quickly. Uh, one, 
No, I really am an idiot because I make fires and burn things and I understand what oxygen does to things and that oxygen in high concentrations is like that that's ideal for stoking fire, flammable even. So for me to guess that the world we live in is 82% oxygen and we don't constantly explode Bad form, Whitman. It's whatever, dude. It's you, basically live radio. What are you gonna you're do? good. I'm not serving uh, you up the questions in a in an easy to understand way. No, anyway. no, no, no. I yeah. my bad. Should have had that too. Okay, so that's a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere, and we are taking that out of. I mean, they're breathing basically just oxygen, right? They're trying to supersaturate the blood with oxygen. Is that what you're? Yeah, you're saying in the, in when, the preparatory. When, yeah, when they're pre breathing. That's right. Yeah. Do you need, I mean, what would happen if we just breathe all oxygen forever? Do you need the other stuff that is in Earth's atmosphere? Are our bodies adjusted to it? Or do we really only need the oxygen part? I don't know the answer to your question. And it's a great question because um, there may be some long-term physiological effects of breathing too much oxygen. And, and the reason I say that is because when I was doing my little lessons to get ready to go into the neutral buoyancy lab, they said, okay... Look, normal scuba divers, they use air, compressed air. We dive with nitrox here at the NBL, which is basically air that has more oxygen in it than normal. Now, normal nitrox is like 32%. Did you see the on the Zoom call, did you see the balloons just go up? Yes, I'm 100% sure that just happened. I think you waved your hand. What just did happened? Did you make a peace sign? How did that I don't happen? know what happened. There were balloons and they came from nowhere. <laughs> I I thought I understood the I was universe talking about other than the concentration stuff. of oxygen in the atmosphere, and now I don't think I know anything. <laughs> I, I'm trying to do the thing like the Uma Thurman dance. In uh, okay, that was fiction. crazy. That's not doing it. So so anyway, the the oxygen um, in the the gas that you breathe at the NBL it's called nitrox forty six. You can't like it's not normal nitrox. So basically, what is the forty six? That's a concentration of oxygen so so if you put more oxygen in your air and you compress it and you go down and you breathe it you can stay down longer okay dep depending on the so depth you go. double ish the oxygen of what you normally get yeah I, I guess it is yeah so so anyway we breathe nitrox at the nbl and so you don't have to worry about doing NB oh neutral buoyancy lab yes i'm sorry okay. forgive me so one thing you do if you're a uh if, if you're a scuba diver you're going to go to the bottom of the pool and like the deepest dive I've ever done was about a hundred feet, and that was Ooh. a long time ago. It was okay, and I was looking at my pressure gauge on my tank, and man, my air was going fast because as I was breathing it, it was compressed more, and I was taking more of the air out of my tank. It's a very interesting thing. So anyway, I was I was diving, and once you do that, if you go that deep and you and you're breathing under such high pressure, you can't go to the surface because you'll get the bend. So you have to go up right. just a little bit. And then you look at your watch, and you just you just sit there, and you float at a certain depth, and you start exhaling the nitrogen, and then you go up to another one. You do it's called a safety stop. You go to a, you know, about ten feet or something. And you'll just start mm -hmm. breathing, breathing, breathing. Try to get rid of all that. And sometimes you'll say, "Hey, we're gonna do a two minute safety stop," and hmm. then we're just breathing the nitrogen out. And then you go to the top, and then you still have nitrogen saturated in your joints and in your blood and stuff. Do so you anyway, feel it afterwards, even if you do it right? I never have, but one of the things you can't do, and this is interesting, is you can't fly after you scuba dive for 24 hours. Huh. Because if you were to go up to your elevation, like, that's less pressure, right? Right. And so anyway, the, the thing that I learned in this trip that was the most eye-opening to me is you want the pressure of the spacecraft to be as close to the pressure of the space suit as possible. Because Neil and Buzz... Okay, that's my third question. I think you're speaking to it right now. Remember a second ago, I was like, oh, I got three things, and I yeah. forgot the third thing? Yeah. The third thing was everything you're describing is so slow. What if something happens... Exactly. And you're like, well, I got to breathe oxygen for three hours. Oh, I, I mean, there's a, there, there's a space gremlin out there destroying our... No, a, life support a real apparatus, thing that can happen. Let, let's breathe. a micrometeorite. Let's say we got like uh, uh, oxygen tanks outside, and a micrometeorite okay. strikes one of the tanks, and they're all connected together. But there's a valve over there. I can go shut the valve, 
oh, there's always a manual switch. Right. Someone's going to have to sacrifice themselves. <laughs> so I, know, I know the spot. Yeah. So basically, you can't just be like, oh, Sanchez, he's going to do it. He's going to save us, you know? You know, I don't know. It just seems... It just seems I think good. Sanchez is the guy, actually. I, I do, yeah. I think so, he's going to be great. So that's the so thing. So the idea here is we could speed up the time that you could get out and address things. And this would, I mean, this is vital for the long-term prospects of doing space stuff or colonizing something with little or no atmosphere. You have to be able to get out there quicker than three plus hours in order to, to just maintain your existence. Cause you're, you're exposed. You have no shield. You have no armor out there. And so the suit, the design of the suit, the pressure of the suit, the pressure of the space colony or space station, all of those things might need to be reconsidered to see if we could shrink the necessary time to respond to things happening outside. Absolutely. And, huh. and you nailed it. That's the deal. And so... I didn't know this was a thing. And so I was able to observe a government test. They let me scuba dive and watch these astronauts in these suits at the bottom of the pool. And and I was able to be like, oh, wow, this makes so much. If we can increase the pressure of the suit or decrease the pressure of the lander, the closer we can get them together, for example, right now, if you needed to go get Band-Aids right now at the store, how long would it take you to get ready? I would slip on my slip-on shoes and be out the door. And if it was, I mean, if that was the thing I needed most in life, I could be out the door in 15 seconds. Exactly. Right. So like we need to be able to respond to that. But if it's the whole church, not church, excuse me. If it's the whole family getting ready to go to church for Easter, right. Okay. And you all want to like, I don't know. I, 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 Let's say for some reason you all have to dress like penguins or something. I know you don't dress up I that don't much. Want to go to that kind of church? Yeah, I know you don't. But but it let's say real let's say culty. it's a I don't know. It's a daddy daughter dance or something, and okay. everybody has to get ready. Like how okay. long is it going to take you guys to get ready? Forever. I know, right? So I I think there's a middle ground. I think there's a middle ground that you can do. I, th I think like an hour, like. If you think about a spacesuit over in the corner, how long is it going to take me to throw on that spacesuit? It's going to take me, I don't know, 30 minutes. I got to put on the magic underwear that cools me off. I got to put on, you know, my diaper. I got to put on my little Snoopy head suit. I got to, like, you know, all 30 minutes, you know, maybe. I don't know. Uh, you're seeing my skeptical face here. I mean, that's nice progress, but you're going to have to figure out something quicker. Because here's the thing, man, my brain goes right to military strategy. If you put people in space, eventually the people will fight each other. Right now, the relationships in space are highly cultivated, curated, controlled. I'm not worried about people on the space station get into a fist fight right now. I think they do great. I don't think that's going to happen. But if you start putting multiple people with multiple interest in, in different stations in space... Well, let me just put it this way. Eventually, people will fight people off of this planet. It's going to happen. Really? It's going to happen. I wish it wouldn't happen, but it's going to happen because of human nature. And we have fought each other everywhere else we've ever been, ever. Why are we not going to fight each other there? If, okay. So if we get to a place where combat happens in space... <laughs> Based on what you're telling me about spacesuits, fastest suit wins. The oh. end. That'll be the deciding technology of who wins at combat in space. Holy crap, man. I've never even thought about that. Also, don't want to think about that, but you're right. <laughs> have, you, have you heard of the... Uh, I've heard about this recently. It's called the Thucydides Trap. This no. I don't know how to say it. I've only read it. It's a trap. Um, that was popularized by this American dude, uh, Graham Allison. I'm reading from the Wikipedia page now. Basically, he says that if there's an emerging power that threatens to displace a great power, then they kind of always get into a fight. There's always a war. And this guy, uh, Allison, he uses this to describe the relationship between China and America. However, 
However, there's a lot of I, I I saw this and I was like, what? You know, he, he's almost speaking as if war is inevitable. And I went back. And I was like, no, nah, there's no. And so there's a lot of counter arguments to this that say, well, actually, if you go back to history, and this is your, I mean, this is your bailiwick. If you go back to history, every time you see a, a new power, an emerging power coming up, oftentimes war happens, but not all the time. And so it's a really interesting thing to study. Um, and uh, maybe we maybe we table that and learn about that a different time. I mean, it's, one thought. Yes. It depends on the time frame. That depends entirely on the parameters. If you say the Phoenicians, under all kinds of pressure in the Levant from the, the coming and going of the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and then the Persians, if you say, all right, well, the Phoenicians decide we're just moving west. We don't want to be a part of this anymore. The Levant is not a good place to live. There's a nice chunk of ground in modern-day Tunisia, North Africa. We're just going to go set up. It's just a colony for now. We're just colonizing what was space to them back then. We're just going to go colonize that. And they quickly figure out, this is way more hospitable to our lifestyle than old Phoenicia, north of modern-day Israel. Let's just move the whole thing over there. Okay, well, if you look at a very narrow time frame there, they overwhelmingly the Carthaginians who are the Phoenicians moved west. Overwhelmingly, they got along with Rome. Eventually, they had a series of really ugly wars with Rome, but it, it kind of defeats the thesis when you zoom out a little bit and you're like, yeah, but for the most part, that worked out. It ended very badly. But do the hundreds of years where it worked out not count for anything? I mean, those are good times. I think it counts. So I, I, my my question on all of that in terms of a big, grand historical theory would be, well, what counts as a rising power, and how long do they have to be rising before we count them? I'm, I'm not sure I'm convinced, but I'm convincible, and that would be a fun conversation for another time. Golly, dude. It, it's so interesting that your brain just instantly solved that problem. Like, the Space Force is a thing, and isn't there like a space movie now where people fight on the moon? I don't know the name of it. For All Mankind. I haven't seen it, but people I don't have know told what that me is. about it. Yeah, it's some kind of show, of and, and I don't know. I know there is a there's a scene that I've seen like floating around on social media of like astronauts with rifles or something. Don't like to think about that. But hmm. the fact that there is a Space Force <laughs> implies that eventually— What a waste. Yeah. What a waste. <laughs> Why I is mean... that a— Oh, you're, just you're seeing baiting. what you went through to almost become an astronaut. You're baiting And then me right thinking now. about what it would look like for somebody to go through all that and just be like, there, go to space. Now, here's a gun. Shoot somebody else who went oh, yeah. through all of that. I mean, yeah. Yeah, just it's... what a squandering of a mind, of a life, of the dream, of the energy. All of that work to go and fight in such an inhospitable space where... The slightest wound is basically death. There you go. I mean, it's just, it never would there have been such an expense of soul and of treasure to get one dude in a place where he could point a gun at another dude. We should not fight in space. This is very, very bad, and that idea sickens me. Even just from a human resources perspective, it's a horrible idea. Like human resources, like, you know... Welcome to any tech. Just a moment, like so, <laughs> like that kind of human resource. No, I'm joking. No, you, you know, know I mean. uh, the Russians put a gun in space. The, the, there's there's a gun on the International Space Station right now. What do you use it for? The idea is for bears. If you land on Soyuz and you land in Europe, or excuse me, in Asia, like if you land in the, on the land, Soyuz is interesting. It's designed to land like on Earth, and so they have these. They call them soft landing rockets, but it's anything but. Like, right when it comes down, there's a radar altimeter. Right before Soyuz, the Russian, you know, reentry capsule, before it hits the ground, it fires these rockets to decelerate you, and so you don't just basically hit really, really hard. You're under a parachute anyway. But What's the short, name of their reentry thing? I haven't heard that term before. Soyuz, S-O-Y-U-Z, the Soyuz capsule. Huh, okay. And, and so anyway, it's like a little gumdrop kind of thing. But anyway, they have a 
a gun on board, as I understand it, in case they land in the wilderness and there's bears. Huh. The, the U.S. has decided, no, we're not going to put a, a gun on the space station. We don't need to do that. But if the Just Russians, bear spray. If the Russians feel like they need to do that, then they can do that. So there is a gun on the International Space Station, which I thought was interesting. Do they say which Russian did it? Was it Anton Chekhov? Because <laughs> that would have so many layers. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Uh, okay. So you get, I mean, what was your experience at the lab? I mean, are you getting suited up alongside the astronauts? Are there other scuba divers in there watching this? I mean, I saw just a, the tiniest little intro to the video, and it looks like they made a moon but put it underwater. And all I can see is you down there writing on a wax clipboard. I mean, I saw the first few seconds. Yeah, it was amazing, dude. So I got to go down. I got to see him do the test. They were picking up rocks. <clears throat> and then I learned about this last thing I'd like to explain. So we, we mentioned earlier that on the moon you have one-sixth of your weight, right? Yeah. Okay. But how much of your mass do you have? <clears throat> All of it? Exactly. All of it. So in football, when you run or basketball, you're running straight and you try to change directions real quick. Yeah. What okay. happens to your feet? Well, that's where a lot of the energy transfer happens. You're pushing off of a, a stable surface to redirect that energy. I mean, you got however many joules of force moving in one direction and you're trying to redirect all of that force, you can't do that without something to work against. So what do your toes feel like when you make that pivot? Let's say you're juking somebody. What, what do your toes feel like in your shoe? You can feel them kind of push. Uh, if it's a poorly fitted shoe, you feel them kind of mash up against the front, and you'll pay for that later. Exactly, right? Okay. So now let's so, – so what enables you to put that much force into the ground? I would argue it's your weight. Uh, and your momentum. I mean, that's what's producing force. No, no. Your momentum doesn't let you put that into the ground. Uh, like you're, you're really, you're, you're having, no, you're having to do a pivot force, right? So you need traction on the ground. So if you're playing basketball, you've got rubber shoes and a hardwood floor. Okay. Yeah. And, and so your side to side forces, like that's friction, right? You need yes. friction on the ground. You need, uh, in other words, traction. You need traction with the ground. Yes. And the reason you can get traction is because of how much you weigh. Do you see that? Yes. It's, it's called your normal but, force. But does, okay, but you don't float when you run. There's downward force pushing your body into the ground as well. I mean, that's that's... That's momentum force. That's angular momentum that's pushing you into that pivot. I mean, it's why you get the, what do they call it? When they when you do drawing classes and you learn how to draw comic book style art, you do all of these exaggerated impossible poses. Yeah. And the one everybody learns in those elementary drawing classes is the impossible pose. And it's the one that is usually depicting the god Mercury, where he's leaning forward in a way that no one could possibly ever stand upright. Okay, but the idea is that that angle you can kind of picture it, it used to be like a maybe yeah. mail or FedEx or yeah. somebody had that as their logo, and you're leaning so far forward that the mind sees that and says you can't achieve that posture standing still. Only with great speed can you do that because when your, C your that, CG is forward of your feet. Yeah. Okay. So when I picture that. And I really break it down in my brain. I am I am sensing downward force, like, like speed, that is driving into the ground, and also forward force and speed that is pushing you forward. But you are telling me, and I'm fully inclined to defer to the engineer on this one, that that pivot is a function of weight not a function of angular momentum. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And so huh. that that downward force that you feel, that there's this thing in physics called the normal force. And so you take the the mass of the object times the the acceleration due to gravity of the object, and that's okay. your normal force. 
Okay. Yeah, sometimes the, okay. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And and so you can you can increase that normal force if you were running on a Hot Wheels ramp and you were running up a curve, then yeah, you, you would have some of that. You'd be slinging out into the ground more, and so you'd have more radial acceleration. That that didn't okay. hit. Pretend pretend I didn't say that. No, 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 <laughs> no. That made no. Yeah. Sonic the Hedgehog. I can picture that. Yep. No, I, that was a great example. I can picture it. Okay. So so your ability to put your foot on the ground and push forward is a function of your normal force or how much weight you have. On the moon, you don't have that. You but 16.7% of that. Correct. But you still have the mass. So you still have the same amount of mass you have to accelerate forward. But you have one sixth of the traction on the ground. This is the first time I have ever understood this. I have never thought about this in my entire life. I didn't understand. I am ahaing this. really hard right now. I didn't understand this till I went and saw what they were doing. And so what they were doing is they were trying to walk in the zero gra the, excuse me the one sixth gravity environment. And granted, the the neutral buoyancy lab is not a perfect simulator because there's water drag all over your body. But you're still, if I were to walk in a straight line towards you right now, and I were to decide I want to pivot and I want to, I want to move to the side, on Earth, that's not a problem at all. But Arthur C. Clarke, the author of 2001 A Space Odyssey, uh -huh. he wrote it like this. He said that you're very sluggish up there. He said that, how, how did he say it? He said that you're, oh... Oh, gosh, I have to get it right. It's like one-sixth. Oh, I wrote it down in the other room. Basically, he said, you are one-sixth, excuse me, you are six times more sluggish than your weight would suggest. That's what he said. You are six times more sluggish than your weight would suggest. So, so you would feel... the other way. It, yeah, right? I, mean, I think in my brain, if you cut 83 Point three percent of my weight, I would be blazing fast. My ability to cut and dart and move, I mean, it'd be amazing. I mean, you'd lose a lot of musculature, so I guess that's there too. But I just imagine, well, you lose weight, you get quicker. Then I think space. I'm like, well, you have lost weight, so you must be quicker. But I hadn't thought about the component that was not intuitive to me that you were just explaining. Your ability to, to use my layman's term, cut, is relative to your weight, which gives you that. Oh wow! Now, now so if, if you were to just run in a straight line, you've seen the astronauts bunny hop in the Apollo footage. If you were to go straight line, then you could ex you could slowly accelerate and you could get going and you could start bunny hopping across the surface. You could probably go faster if I had to guess. You could probably go faster, but the moment I you're not going to have races in tracks on the moon at least not in tight tracks, like in, in a circle, because the ability to turn is compromised because you have all of the inertia that you have right here on Earth. If you could run as fast as you could here on Earth, on the moon, and then, and then I say, okay, stop, it would start a long, a very long event of you plowing a ditch on the moon because... The soil is not very compacted in certain places, you know. It's like moon dust. And you would try to put traction into the ground, but you would just drag your toes. And it's it's a really odd thing to think about that I had never understood. But anyway, that was the big... There are two takeaways for me from this whole experience. Number one, I just did the balloons again. Did you see it's that? It's the thumbs up. What? I don't have it activated, but you do. You did a thumbs up, and a thumbs up just appeared. <laughs> Oh, Look there it is. But how did the balloons happen? That's the thumbs up. I don't, I don't, I don't know. know what just happened. Maybe. Okay, there's two things that I learned uh, at this experience that were amazing. The first one is you want the pressure of your spacecraft to be as close to the operating pressure of your spacesuits as possible. That's thing okay. number one. Now, you asked a great question earlier about can you just go 100% oxygen forever? I don't know. I do know they monitored me for oxygen toxicity. I don't know what that means. And like the guy goes, hey, uh, that was a great dive. Just stay right here. I got to monitor you for 10 minutes for oxygen toxicity. And I said, what? 
what does what would that look like? He goes, ah, just a bunch of shaking and stuff. You 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 look fine. And I was like, what? Hold on. What does this mean? Anyway, so the first thing I learned, you want your spacecraft and your space suit to be as close in pressure as possible. And the second thing I learned is that walking around on the moon is is in my, it wasn't difficult. It was just different. I actually called a guy from he retired from NASA. And I said, hey, you know, I'm doing this video and I'm just doing a little research here. And I want to ask you about word on the street is you're the expert on the falls on the moon that the Apollo astronauts had. I just want to talk to you about that a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, I hear it's difficult that they're, you know, the way they, they did it, it was just pretty difficult. He goes, you do not propagate that bull crap about it being hard. They had fun on the moon. And I was like, wait, what? I'm just, he goes, they enjoyed it. They were skipping. They were singing while they were walking. They, it was not difficult. It was different. <laughs> okay. That was a yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. It, but it was the second thing is that you are more sluggish because you have the same amount of momentum, but you don't have the ability to cut or transfer any of that to the soil. You don't. But have I traction. feel that a little bit underwater when I fight with my kids and we do underwater karate and Street Fighter and stuff. Some of that, some of that is the resistance of the water, but I'm compensating for that. Some of that is the fact that I simply don't have the weight to drive into the bottom of the pool surface, if I'm understanding you correctly, that I do when we do fake Street Fighter karate ninja stuff in real life. I just simply don't have the ability to drive off of that and change directions. I attributed that entirely to the resistance of the water, I think I'm now understanding that there are two functions working against me here. One is the resistance of the water. Two is I don't weigh that much in the water and it's harder to push off. I don't know if it's much to work with. My mouth is agape because I can't believe I didn't see that, but you're absolutely right. Man, that would have been a great illustration to talk about, but I didn't see it. That That's a great illustration. Good job. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for teaching me that. Yeah, that's great. So... Yeah, that, that was it. Those are the two big things I learned, um, and I loved it. The opportunity was incredible. Um, the people at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, there was a guy there named Dominic Del Rosso that he actually was part of the reduced gravity vomit comets thing I did when I was an undergrad. He was oh. running it at the time, and now he's doing other things. The, the man's done everything. And there's another guy named Pat Keller. He's a scuba diver, and he's the guy that – basically he babysat me the whole time, and he kept me safe. And uh, they did great, and so it, it was it was wonderful. But there, there's some things about that video that I can't. I don't think I'd do a good job of explaining it. Like Neil Armstrong's actually in the video, and he explains something about the angle of attack of a spacecraft on the moon, and okay. he, it made me realize that landing. So HLS, the Human Lander System of uh, that NASA's working on. The ability to land that on the moon, it's, it's like a cartoon way to land a rocket. Like it's the, the starship for SpaceX. You land it on the, you know, the tail, kind of like mm -hmm. upright on the moon. Okay. One thing I realized making this video is that when we come in to land that thing, we're going to have to spend a lot of fuel just stopping it, stopping its lateral motion because you have to tilt over rockets a lot more on the moon to stop them. It's hard to explain, but it, it makes sense with graphics in the video. So I realized that in order to land on the moon, we're going to basically have to be coming straight down like a needle, you know, like a pencil when you were jumping in the swimming pool, you know, when you were, yeah. you know, the pencil. So yeah, it, it, it was a, a wonderful experience. And uh, I think, I, I think that's the, the, the main deal. Those two things, the traction was amazing. I got to see an astronaut fall on his back on like on the bottom of the pool. And I understood why, because it was, he mismanaged his CG. He didn't mismanage. It was just different. He was having fun. He was singing. There you go. <laughs> Don't propagate that bull crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. it. It was great to. Uh, it was great to experience it. So thanks for uh, thanks for having that conversation. I I will never see the physical world the way I did before this conversation. I understand my relationship with the world around me better than I did before we talked. And what an amazing way to spend whatever it's been an hour and a half. I can't say that after most conversations. I really understand the physical world better. Thank you. Well, thank you for teaching me that when I'm wrestling 
in the shallow end of a swimming pool that yes, I'm fighting the drag, but I'm also not getting traction on the ground, which is why it's so hard to run in a swimming pool. That's interesting. That's weird that that's what you took with you. The real important thing that I taught you in this conversation is that the only honorable death for a fish that is your friend is what? To trident them in the swim bladder. <laughs> that is correct. R.I.P. Godspeed, Destin Salmon. Godspeed. <laughs> <laughs>